I'm not going to tell you about the 10 years of research that have gone into my trying to answer one single hard question, which is, uh, is Israel and its US lobby above the law in the United States? I've spent 10 years trying to answer that question. I'm just going to share with you a few case studies very quickly. Uh, we got off to the wrong, on the wrong foot back in the 1940s. If you look closely enough, you can see ongoing damage from that poor launch in which the United States was visited by the government in waiting, uh, the Jewish agency led by David Ben-Gurion, and rather than do anything else, they set up a vast illegal smuggling network through an archipelago of nonprofit organizations that were there specifically to steal World War II surplus and channel it to Jewish fighters in Palestine. Some of the material was bought for cents on the dollar. Some of the material was stolen outright from the US Marines in Hawaii, as was the case of Nathan Lifford. 50 caliber machine guns, materials and manpower for Palestine stole the entire uh, list from the US chaplain so that they could recruit more effectively in sending veterans of World War II to fight in Palestine. The Sonnenborn Institute, which was organized by former Zionist Organization of America chair, uh, was uh, very effective in channeling via third, uh, second and third countries all sorts of tank ammunition, aircraft, explosives, and was able to get it for pennies on the dollar, completely in violation of the Arms Export Control Act and all sorts of uh, laws, including the Neutrality Act. They cared little about Americans shipping material inside of boilers, inside of missiles marked boxes dropping onto piers in New York. They didn't care about that because they had a higher purpose. That purpose was to win a state, and they were successful. If we look at some of the uh, activities inside the Justice Department to cover up all of this, what you see is a very effective counterforce. Whenever the FBI was getting close, and there's a 7,000 page file in the National Archives with surveillance photographs of B-17s and materials and guns moving through the US logistics system, what you would find is in the Justice Department's own files, Lobbyists such as Abraham Feinberg, the Uber lobbyist, cash bundling king, would assemble a war chest and mobilize people to quash prosecutions. They had 100 people they were going to arrest and prosecute on the West Coast alone. Never happened. There were only a handful of people who actually suffered any felony convictions, relatively low level people. The big fish of the Jewish agency, Naomi Bernstein, writing the checks from New York, never indicted. And this was because because there was a vast amount of influence over the president, a vast amount of access to the Justice Department Attorney General. And so the basic uh, advice and consent rights of Americans were fundamentally undermined. They had no choice. They had no say in what was happening to this military equipment. That had been decided for them, and the necessary prosecutions didn't happen. Hank Greenspun, he has a balcony on Pennsylvania Avenue named after him at the museum, became rich smuggling weapons uh, to Palestine. He offered $25,000 to many people in Washington to quash those prosecutions, only got a felony. Well, some of these people graduated. One of the biggest uh, problems in Pennsylvania right now is this. There is one plant that lost more highly enriched uranium, weapons grade uranium, than any other nuclear fuel plant in the United States. It just happened to be run by two Zionist Organization of America officials, uh, Ivan Novik and Zalman Shapiro, and a smuggler from the uh, 1940s uh, network of smuggling, David Lowenthal, who was very active with Israeli intelligence. So what happened to NUMEC? It was uh, constantly inviting in the top spies from Israel to visit the plant. In particular, Raphael Eaton, who would later run Jonathan Pollard, 
and a number of other extremely effective covert operations people. There were eyewitness accounts of Zalman Shapiro and other people sealing weapons-grade uranium into irradiators for shipment to Palestine on an accelerated, excuse me, to Israel on an accelerated basis. And the amount of material unaccounted for today is 339 kilograms. They lost 2% of the entire throughput when Shapiro and the ZOA crew were in charge, it only went back down after they were forced out of ownership. Uh, what happened in the LBJ, Nixon, and subsequent administration? The record shows they were fearful of the political consequences of going after these people. They tried to move them around. They tried to assuage their concerns. Uh, but there are... Uh, Others who were more forthright, the CIA chief of the Tel Aviv station said, Numik was an Israeli operation from the beginning, and that is exactly what the record shows. Unfortunately for the people who have to live in the environs of a defunct uh, weapons smuggling plant, uh, they're facing a $500 million US Army Corps of Engineer cleanup. Uh, and their water and township is completely polluted. Uh, there were a few questions about the uh, connections between Israel lobbying groups uh, and foreign principles. Abraham Feinberg was also extremely effective providing seed funding to APAC, writing various checks. Uh, he also was the head of the uh, organization that was, according to Abner Cohen, the prime uh, organization for putting together fundraising for Israel's nuclear weapons research, the Wiseman Institute. Uh, he would also give money to AIPAC, which would write helpful articles, such as Israel could never become a nuclear power, running a counter-propaganda ring whenever the US was looking too closely. Now, there was a good question this morning about the 1938 Foreign Agents Registration Act. Why are Israel lobbying organizations, which are closely coordinating with foreign principles, and in some cases receiving money, uh, able not to be as transparent as other organizations that are lobbying for foreign principle. Uh, simple fact of the matter is, when ordered to register, they don't. They fight it. When forced to register, they undergo a transformation into something else and continue their operations. And there's no better case of that than the case that led uh, to the creation of APAC. But first, the Zionist organization was ordered uh, seven times to register because it was a subsidiary of the World Zionist Organization. But they, according to Justice Department documents uh, by underlings, got to the AG who said, I'm not going to enforce the law. You don't have to register. You don't have to be transparent in your communications. Uh, they also got to uh, the biggest attempt to register Israel lobbying groups in America, which was in the 1960s when the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the Justice Department, concerned about overseas provocations dragging America into war, they cited in their chartering investigative document the Levon Affair twice, in other words, Israel twice as being provoking activities that would draw American into unwise overseas interventions. And so they decided to raid the Jewish agency, to raid the American Zionist Council, seize documents, and saw that they were bringing in money uh, from the Jewish agency for public relations and for uh, publicity. So what happened? Well. Uh, they were ordered by the Justice Department to register as foreign agents in 1962. The unincorporated lobbying division, however, split off six weeks later and is still with us today. That organization is called the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, and it continues the work of the original American Zionist Council that was ordered to shut down under this FARA order. So foreign reg agent registration orders have never really been applied rigorously, even in cases of documented violations of its transparency provisions. There's a little copy of the Kennedy foreign agents registration order. So what's happened because of that? Here's. Uh, a snapshot of our worst free trade agreement ever signed, in which exports are, uh, Im exports are half of what imports are. This is the US-Israel free trade agreement. 
Uh, it was lobbied against by 70 organizations in uh, the uh, mid-1980s, including Monsanto, Sunkist, AFL-CIO. They didn't want to lower US trade barriers to Israel. On the other side was APAC and a group of small organizations. They stole the trade secrets of their opposition, which had been given to the International Trade, uh, the International, um, trade Commission, and used it against them in public relations and lobbying, and got a heck of a deal for being able to, once again, thwart American interests and, uh, and get it their own way. It's resulted in a chronic $10 billion per year deficit. It's resulted in... Uh, 100 billion cumulative deficit to the United States, and the question is, was it worth it? Well, yes, it created 120,000 jobs in a foreign country instead of here. It really transferred a lot of secrets to the Israelis about production costs, transfer pricing, and the Justice Department ultimately refused, even though they tracked it back to Dan Halpern of the Ministry of Economics, refused to continue the investigation when he claimed diplomatic immunity. So it's a, it's a bad deal, but it's not the only prosecution that's been thwarted. In December, uh, we had declassified documents of the counter-espionage investigation of the ADL. The ADL back in the 90s had been investigated for holding FBI and other classified documents in a campaign that they were launching against pro-Palestinian and anti-apartheid uh, anti activists, two of whom died <laughs> under mysterious circumstances. But what the memos once again reveal, if you read them online, is that there was an intervention at high levels. The uh, record reveals that two high-ranking Israeli generals were dispatched to talk to Janet Reno. She dropped the case. The espionage investigation died. 2005, the same thing happened. Two AIPAC lobbyists were indicted. They were using secrets to try to gin up a war with Iran. They were passing it to Glenn Kessler. Steve Rosen said he was trying to show that Iran was engaged in total war against the US and Iraq. And of course, the Obama administration and the judges involved didn't keep it in the system. So uh, it's gotten to the point of ridiculousness. Uh, we have. Uh, other documents revealing a smuggling ring in the 80s uh, that involved not only our non Milchan, Hollywood producer, and Richard Kelly Smith, but also Benjamin Netanyahu himself working on the Israeli side. Uh, where are these people now? Uh, have they ever been, suffered any consequences for being involved in the documented theft of nuclear triggers called tri Krytrons? No, uh, Milchan was hiding out you know, at the Academy Awards, clearly there in the center picture. He doesn't seem to be too afraid. And of course, Netanyahu was with his favorite coup here, APAC. Uh, the problem's ongoing. It hasn't gone away. Nuclear technology continues to flow from the United States, but we're not prosecuting it. We're disbanding them through regulations, or we're sealing off uh, warranted criminal investigations uh, instead of pursuing them, such as the case of Stuart Nozette. So my conclusion is there is no U.S. law that if it stands in the way of Israel and its U.S. lobby <clears throat> that cannot be thwarted, overcome, uh, subvented, and the Justice Department in most cases collapses well before any warranted prosecutions take place.